Before you begin, get all your supplies organized for the project. Then cut out your paper pattern and attach it to the felt. You can use washi tape, baste, or make an iron-on freezer paper pattern. Take a look through the Before You Begin and Tools and Materials chapters in the book for more details. When you're ready, rough cut the pieces from the felt, then carefully cut them out one at a time. I like to cut the paper first, then the felt in a single layer for the most accurately cut pieces. Begin with the basic body before you dive into the animal's heads. For beginners, this allows the opportunity to practice stitching on the body, which will eventually be covered by clothing. The legs and the arms of my animals are wired with plush cotton pipe cleaners, and folding those to length is the first step. You'll need to make a folding template from chipboard, which you can find in Otter's pattern pages and at the back of the book for the other animals. The chipboard I use is like the backing board on most notepads, but you could also use a cereal box or any other slim, sturdy, single-ply cardboard. You'll want to fold the pipe cleaners around the template with a crisp fold at either end. Then cut their ends at the center lines, leaving a gap between them. You'll remove them from the card, clip them in pairs, and use a single strand of floss to bind them together finishing with a square knot. Next up is making the legs and arms tubes. Using a single strand of floss and a whip stitch, stitch up the sides, leaving one end of each open. Then slip one pipe cleaner bundle into each tube. As you insert them, Support the end of the tube and the bundle with your fingers, so the pipe cleaner doesn't buckle at its center. Then stitch their ends closed, hiding the finishing knots. When the limbs are complete, you can assemble the body. Before you get going though, poke a hole through the paper pattern and mark Otter's tail placement on the felt. The body goes together much like a stick figure with a pipe cleaner spine. So first, you'll fold the legs piece in half, with the seam facing in. The gap we left when binding the pipe cleaners makes it easy to find and fold at the center point. Fold a new pipe cleaner around the midpoint and make a few twists up the spine. Then slip the body piece between the legs with the spine sandwiched inside the felt. To add the arms to our stick figure, fold back the front body. And if you've over-twisted as I did, untwist a bit until you can center the arms piece into the spine. The top edge of the arms should line up with the shoulder point on the body, which is marked on the pattern with arrows. Twist to hold the arms in place, then pin at the shoulder points. Now begin whip stitching under the arm and down the side of the body to the hip. As you make your way around the hip, transition the whip stitch from catching the two side edges to catching the edge of the body and the leg's surface. To do this, it's helpful to sharply angle the needle and move the opposite leg out of the way to gain access to the seam. There are many slight modifications you can make when using the whip stitch, which I go through in the technique section of the book, and it's worth taking a good look through that before you dive in. When you come back to the hip, make a few tacking stitches on top of one another to secure the thread, then make an ending knot and hide it below the surface. Go ahead and repeat that on the opposite side, then stuff the lower half of the body. Either a bamboo skewer or a stuffing fork is the perfect tool for getting fiber into small places. Use the blunt end of the bamboo skewer and a twisting motion or use a stuffing fork like this one. Don't go too crazy with the body stuffing because overpacking will make the clothing tight later on.
just add enough to the lower body to fill it without stretching the seams. Next, we'll whip stitch from the neck to the shoulder on both sides of the body, leaving the arms unstitched for now. Stuff the upper body, chest, and neck. Here again, avoid overstuffing or clothing might become tight later on. Waiting to stitch around the arms allows the chest to expand slightly with stuffing and for you to make sure the arms are centered in the body cavity. When you have the arms centered, use an edge to surface whip stitch around them as you did with the legs. The construction we've done here is the same for otter, ratty, badger, mole, and to some extent toad. Although he has his own unique limb construction with his flappy feet and hands. Lastly on the basic body, we'll trim, fold, and bind the pipe cleaners that extend from the neck. Now we're on to Otter's unique head construction. Begin by marking the eye placement on the felt through the pattern as you did with the tail. Then remove the pattern pieces. The three V-shaped notches on the side head pieces are called darts. If you're new to sewing, you may not be familiar with them. But these types of cuts, when matched and stitched, transform a flat piece of fabric into a three-dimensional one. The stitching for the darts will eventually be on the inside of the head, so make sure your eye markings are on the opposite side from where you stitch. Whip stitch each dart with a single strand of floss. Stitching from the base of the V to the outer edge. On dart stitching, I like to set my knots back from the edge of the felt so I don't catch them later when I'm stitching the center seam. To do this, slip the needle through the felt surface next to the seam line, then make your ending knot. Repeat this on all six darts, then pin or clip the two side head pieces together, matching the darts, with the eye markings inside and the stitching on the outside. I tested both clips and pins here to see which I preferred, and the pins won out. They were a bit less bulky when matching Otter's three sets of darts. As with the basic body and darts, whip stitch the center seam with a single strand of floss. Stitch from under the chin to just beyond the top head dart. Then make your ending knot and turn the head right side out. Whip stitch the back head seam, leaving the neck hole open. Unlike their lightly stuffed bodies, Otter, Mole, Ratty, and Badger all have firmly stuffed heads. Firm stuffing reveals the shape of the head patterns and allows you to cinch in the eyes for facial definition without the head collapsing. Use a bamboo skewer or stuffing fork and insert small pinches of stuffing that fill the head gradually. Fill the nose first, then move on to the center of the head cavity. This way you'll have more control and time to shape the head until it's just right. I've sped up the head stuffing here so you can see the entire process. It's pretty surprising how much fiber fits in. I 
As you fill the head, turn and pivot it so it fills symmetrically. I don't measure the weight of the stuffing before I begin, but instead I do it all by feel. But for the book, I took apart head samples for each animal so I could share an estimate of what you can expect to use. Don't worry, you don't have to get that technical, of course. You can do it by feel, too. As you make animals, they'll naturally become more refined with practice. When it becomes hard to add any more fiber, snip up into the stuffing through the neck hole with a sharp pair of scissors, making a channel for more stuffing. This channel technique is like sculpting from the inside out. You can add more fiber without creating lumps at the surface and add targeted stuffing to any area that needs it by angling the channel towards the necessary spot. I know it seems unbelievable, but I think I can still fit in a bit more. As I think I'm getting close, I give it a bit of a squeeze to feel the right stuffing density. You can also use this squeezing technique to make fine adjustments on the finished head. From front to back will widen the head, side to side will lengthen the face, and top to bottom on the nose will widen and flatten the muzzle. To attach the head, we'll make another scissor channel for the pipe cleaners at the neck. Bend the arms to get them out of your way, then twist the body as you push the pipe cleaners up into the channel. Use a two-strand length of floss to attach the head. Hide your starting knot beneath the head's edge and use a blind stitch to connect the head to the body. To work the blind stitch, insert the needle parallel to the stitch line and alternate stitches between the head and the body as you work your way around. Stitch about one quarter of the way and then pull the floss taut. The cool thing is when you pull the floss, the stitch draws in and disappears as it tucks under the head's felt edge. Continue the blind stitch all the way around the neck, periodically pulling and tightening the thread as you go. Continue stitching around until you've made two passes for good measure, just to be sure Otter has a securely attached head on his shoulders. Then, knot off and hide your knot. Next up, let's make some more seams disappear. Using the sharp end of a pin, scratch and loosen the felt fibers over the center seam line and darts. I love this technique and I use it all the time, but it's even more exciting for beginners. If you have any worries about inconsistent stitches, this fabulous comb over can really elevate your final creation. Finish up the comb over with a hot iron held upright. Press and pivot the head onto its surface to smooth and flatten the felt, especially the seams and darts. The next step is great to complete just before bed, so you can sleep through the drying process. We'll be brushing hairspray onto the surface of Otter's head to prepare it for painting his face. This will take several hours to dry, so if it's not time to turn in, you can move on to Otter's clothing as the head dries. It's good to have a container to prop Otter up in after his spa treatment. Pour some hairspray into a small dish and apply it to Otter's head. Saturate the surface all over, avoiding a margin around the neck so the fabric there remains flexible for later positioning. When Otter's head is completely dry, iron it again to super smooth the surface. Now we're ready to add some eyes and all the details that give him personality. You'll need two six millimeter eyes, a bamboo skewer with a sharp end, matching floss, and a long darning needle. 
Otter's eyes are a bit more forward facing than mole, ratty, or badgers, so we'll stitch them in from front to back at an angle like this, exiting on either side of the center seam, instead of side to side. Use the sharp end of the bamboo skewer to poke the two eye holes at the markings. You want the hole to be large enough so the back shaft of the eye drops into it. Use a two strand length of floss and insert the needle from front to back, exiting on the opposite side of the center seam. Enter the needle through the exit hole from back to front, returning through the eye hole. Now the starting knot is well lodged into the stuffing and we can add our first eye. Repeat this back and forth, catching the eye on the second pass. Now cinch in the eye, then knot off on the back of the head and hide the knot. Any holes you've made can be disguised with a few scratches and the hit of a hot iron. Now repeat that process on the second eye and then we'll move on to some eyelids. These little guys get placed about halfway over each eye and glued to the surface of the head. Before we do that though, we're going to feather the curved edge of the eyelid so that when we glue it onto the head, the surface is nice and smooth and the eyelid blends into the face. Go ahead and just take your needle and scratch out the edge there, softening and feathering it as you go. Once I've finished up with my pin, I'm just gonna pick off all the little pills from the edge so we have a nice feathered edge. And then I'll repeat that on the second eyelid. I like to use fast grab tacky glue to attach the eyelids. It's much thicker than your standard tacky glue. It doesn't run at all, and like its name, it grabs really quickly. Go ahead and take a bit of the glue on your finger and smooth it on one side of the eyelid, which will become the back. You don't want a thick goopy layer, but more of a smooth one that catches all of the little fibers on the ends because you want those to be attached to the head too. It's helpful to have a little paper towel and some water so you can clean off your fingers so you don't get any of the wet glue onto otter's head here. Lay the eyelid over the eye about halfway and you can experiment with the angle that you have it which will give him sort of different expressions. So lay it down and press it with your finger and you can see the transition now but once we give it a little hot iron press it's going to smooth everything out and dry the glue. Go ahead and pick any little stringy bits off. Perhaps you have some of the fibers that didn't get glued or a little bit of dried glue. Just pick that off. There's another technique we're gonna to use to finish up the eyelids, but before we do that, let's get the second eyelid on. So I have to warn you, uh, you're not gonna to be too impressed with the way things look just yet. But what we're going to do is go for our hairspray again. I'm just gonna cover my work surface with some freezer paper here to protect from the hairspray. Go ahead with your brush again and brush onto the backs of the eyelids. You wanna saturate the whole area where the eyelids were attached to the head. Once you finish applying the hairspray, set Otter aside to dry. Here again, if you have your materials ready, you can work on his dungarees while you wait. Once he's dry, go ahead and press the eyelids again, avoiding hitting the eye itself. To add the ears, we're gonna feather the flat edge just like we did the eyelids. Go ahead and feather both ends and pick off the pills just like you did before. Then you can look at where they're gonna go on the head. 
I like to put them on with pins and fiddle around with their location until I'm happy and I have them both even on either side of the head. Once you've got them happily situated, you can take the pins out and use the pin markings on the head as your guide for where to glue the ear on. So again, I'm just putting a little bit of glue on the end, picking off any of the little fuzz, and I'm placing the ear on the holes that I made with my pins. And now I'll just do that to the other side. Again here, I'm using my pinholes to help place the ear, and I've got a little leeway. I can kind of position and reposition if I need to. And our little hairspray trick will do the same thing that it did for the eyelids and hide that connection. After the hairspray on the back of the ears is dry, go ahead and iron it again, and then you can move on to painting the face. So I've got some white titanium paint here. It's directly out of the tube. I wanted it to be a little bit dry for his face because of the way I'll be pushing the paint around. I'm using a number four or six brush here, and the shape that I'm making for his muzzle is sort of like an upside down heart without a point. So I'm just beginning at the middle and working outwards. That's sort of the bottom of one of the lobes of the heart. If you feel like you want a little bit more control than what you would have with a brush for the outline, you could use one of the acrylic, a white acrylic paint pen to create the outline of this and then fill that in with your brush. So once you get the basic shape, you want to dry off your brush. And then if you can see what I'm doing here, I'm just pushing the wet paint out the edge so that the edge becomes less crisp and a little bit softer. I'm moving right along here, but I recommend you give the muzzle time to dry before starting under the chin. It's easy to slip and smudge the paint. I've actually dropped a few heads that I was making right into my paint dish. But the good news is that every time I slipped, I was able to remove the paint and save the head. I'm working on a series of technique tutorials now, and I plan to cover that in one of them. So I'm just going along here and filling in the cheeks with paint and softening the edges as I did with the muzzle. Just as before, if you want to outline the cheeks with a paint pen, or use a watery wash to rough out the painted areas as I did for Mole's face, feel free to try other techniques on Otter as well. There are a variety of ways to approach the face painting, and with some experimentation, you'll find what works best for you. Okay, I think I've just got a few final dashes of edge softening here, and then I think I'm happy with the white paint. When you're ready, set Otter aside and allow the paint to dry before moving on. Next, mix up some pale pink with either red and white or bubblegum pink and white, as I've done here. A bit of pale pink here will help highlight the mouth. For the nose, use a permanent fineliner pen. My favorites are these Micron pens. You can begin by drawing a short vertical line from the bottom center of the heart up to connect with the nose. If you're more comfortable beginning with a pencil, you can do that too. Just rough out the nose shape before moving on to more permanent markings. The nose is sort of like a wide pie slice, roughly a quarter of a circle in size with softly bowed edges. On the two top corners of the nose, add a tiny half circle. When you're happy with the shape, color the nose black with either a micron pen, a paint pen, or a paintbrush. 
Here, I've skipped ahead a bit and painted the next layer off screen with my brush. This charcoal gray layer is slightly smaller, covering most of the black, except for a slim margin around the edge. Use either a brush or paint pen for this layer. Allow the gray paint to dry, then use a micron pen to draw nostrils over the gray, connecting them with the black margin. Continue with the micron pen, outlining the bottom of the muzzle to create the mouth. I decided to thicken the line in the center and fade it out into a fine line at the outer edges. I think I want a bit more pink on the mouth too, so I'll just go back in and add that now. If you want Otter to have a wet looking nose, use some clear nail polish to give it some shine. If the brush doesn't bring it all the way out to the edges nicely, you can use a pin to bring the edges out before it dries. When the polish is dry, draw in the whisker dots on either side of the muzzle. To make the whiskers themselves, I'm using a fine white silk thread. You can also use a single strand of embroidery floss but I like the scale and weightlessness of the silk thread. So if you have some, or you want to pick up a spool, I think you'll enjoy it too. To add more strength and a bit of levity, I'm giving the thread a coating of Taylor's wax. Wax is great for needle threading too. So take a look through the techniques chapter at the back of the book for more on that. When the length is coated, thread your needle without knotting the end. To make each pair of whiskers, we'll stitch an X through the muzzle, leaving a whisker on either side. It's hard to see with all the white on white, but the illustrations are clear. Let's look at them side by side to see the process. For the first pair, stitch from right to left through two of the muzzle dots at a downward angle, following the arrow and leaving a tail where you would normally have a knot. Now enter the same hole you just exited and pass directly across the muzzle to the dot on the opposite side. Make the final pass for the first set of whiskers. Enter through the hole you just exited from, angling the needle up to the dot opposite from your first entry dot. Okay, so I realize this is all a bit of a tongue twister and maybe a mind bender, so if it doesn't all make sense now, when you sit down to stitch the whiskers, look again at the illustrations and think of the X you create with basic shoelacing, and I think it will all become clear. Using the X stitching technique, make whisker pairs until you have a whisker for every dot. As you work, you'll likely need a pin to untangle a whisker or two that gets caught up in your stitching. When you have a face full of whiskers, Tip otter upside down, separate the strands, and give them a shot of hairspray. The combination of hairspray and wax on the lightweight silk thread should create gravity-defying facial hair. Not something I want when I look in the mirror, but it's a good look for otter. As the hairspray dries, separate them again and trim them to length. When I looked at otter pictures, I found that the whiskers were all slightly different lengths, so I tried to mimic that in my trimming. Now, just one more spritz of hairspray, separate the whiskers, and we can move on to the next thing. Otters have cute little whiskers above their eyes, so I couldn't leave those out. I waxed the silk thread here again before stitching, and I think stills are clearer than action shots for this, so let's take a look. First, you'll insert the needle above the eye at point A, leaving a little tail, then exit at point B. You'll enter again at B through the same hole and exit at C, and then enter again at C and stitch back up to B, leaving a tail there as well. Let's take a look at it in action here. So that's from A to B, from B to C, from C back to B again. And then you can just trim off leaving a tail and you'll repeat that on the other side. 
The lashes here are going to get the same treatment as the whiskers with some hairspray, so I'm just giving them a little spritz here. I covered the eyes so that the eyes won't become cloudy. And I'm just fiddling around with the, with the whiskers here to get them to stay straight back and not flop forward. And that is it for the whiskers. Then we can just give them a little trim. And that is it. And now we can move on to the tail. Man, he's cute. Okay, so the tail gets wired like the body so that it's bendable. And I'm just cutting my pipe cleaner down here and I'm gonna give it a little trim. So I'm trimming it this way so that it will fit into the pointed tail, the really skinny pointed tail. So I just trimmed a little bit off and I'm folding it over so the pipe cleaner doesn't break through or uh, poke through. And then I'm trimming the top as well. And that's so that when we insert the pipe cleaner into the body, it will uh, slide in a little bit more easily with the big fluffy pipe cleaner. Next, we're gonna go ahead and whip stitch the side of the tail. We'll just fold it in half and whip stitch from the opening at the end to the pointed tail. You can use a pin or a clip here, whatever works better for you, just to hold everything in place as you stitch. When you get to the end, just knot off and hide your knot as usual. When that's done, you can just put your pipe cleaner into the tail and then we are going to add a little bit of stuffing. You don't want too much stuffing in the tail because you still want it to be bendable. So don't go overboard here. So once you've got the tail stuffed, you wanna thread your needle with two strands of floss and you'll make a little running stitch that goes around the tail opening. I like to use two strands of thread for this part because when I come around full circle, I'm gonna to need to cinch in the thread and gather it. And I like the extra strength of the two strands. When you come back to your starting point, go ahead and cinch in the thread, and then you can take another pass around the tail just for good measure to make sure it's nice and secure. Now just finish up with an ending knot. With the tail complete, we're ready to make our hole and then insert the tail into the body. I like to give it a little bend to just see how my stuffing job was. There we go. And now we are going to use a blind stitch just like we used for the head to attach the tail. As you work, you're going to want to bend it out of your way so that you can access the seam line there. So I'm gonna go around here a second time for good measure again, just like we did on the head, and knot off and hide my knot. So that is it for Otter, and now we're on to his dungarees. So as with most of the clothing in the book, there are uh, quite a few little parts that we can add before we assemble the pants themselves, including the pocket, the snaps, and the straps. So it doesn't really matter which you start with here, whether you start with the pocket or the snaps. I'm gonna go ahead and start with the snaps. And we should just take a look at the two different sides of the snaps here. On the strap ends, we'll use the nipple side of the snap, which is just a bit slimmer and it will fit nicely on the end of our straps. On the bib, we're going to use the dimple side of the snap. So let's start there. And you'll need to thread your needle with a single strand of floss. I like to put the dimple side on the bottom. And this is because the dimple side is thicker than its mate and the stitched result looks cleaner and tidier if you can sew through from the front to the back, making stitching visible on both sides of the fabric. The nipple side is slimmer in profile and you can scoop just the surface of the felt beneath it as you stitch, making the finished stitches visible only on the snap side, 
while leaving the outer surface free of stitches. On the dimple side, I'm going through each hole three times, and then I move forward to the next from the back. That will keep my stitches through the holes only and avoid diagonal stitches between them. So I'll go through all four holes and knot off on the back. You can see here, I've stitched the dimple sides of two snaps to the front right side of the dungarees on the corners of its bib. And on the back wrong side, I've attached one nipple side of the snap for the dungarees closure. Later, when we stitch the nipple sides of the snaps to the strap ends, I'll revisit what I just described about scooping the surface of the felt and making stitches invisible on the front side. Now let's move on to the pocket. We'll center it on the front of the bib and you can use the pattern as a reference for placement. We'll attach it with another version of the edged surface whip stitch. When we stitched around the legs and arms, we used a slightly different version of this stitch. But this time, however, we'll have access to both sides of the material. I like to make this stitch in two passes, from back to front, coming up and catching the edge of the pocket. Then, from front to back, skimming the pocket edge as you go. Often in situations like this, people scoop their stitches, going from back to front in one move. And that's not a problem if you prefer it. But with this method, I find it much easier to make the stitches even and parallel instead of at an angle and cocked this way and that. When you've stitched around the sides and the bottom of the pocket, knot off on the back. I also added a vertical running stitch to the pocket about one third of the way across its width. For the straps, we'll finish their edges with a buttonhole stitch for strength and decoration. This stitch looks similar to its cousin, the blanket stitch. Both stitches begin with a whip stitch, but as you draw the loop around the edge, you pass the needle through it. For the buttonhole stitch, the needle passes through the back side of the loop in the direction of your stitching. This results in a twist that locks the stitch down to the edge. For a blanket stitch, the needle passes in the opposite direction towards your previous stitch and does not form a twist. Without the twist, you must maintain constant tension as you work. Both are lovely and look almost identical but that tiny twist is magical. Give both methods a try and see what you think. When you've completed the edge stitching on both straps, it's time to stitch the remaining two nipple sides of the snaps. Before you do, take note of the straps angled ends. These attach to the back edge of the dungarees and cross each other. Make sure to stitch the snap sides to the correct face of the felt based on those angles. You might pin them in place temporarily and mark the snap side to keep track. As I mentioned earlier, I would revisit how to stitch the nipple side of the snap without having visible stitches on the front of the felt. Slip the needle through just the surface of the felt at the rounded end to hold the knot. Center the snap. It's a bit fiddly, but you can pinch one side with your thumb. As you make your stitches, only grab the surface of the felt so no stitches will be visible on the front of the snap. When you pass to the next hole, slip the needle under the snap edge and come up through the hole. This will keep the stitches tidy and hide the diagonal connection stitches between the holes. On the thicker dimple side of the snap, this does not work. The needle can't flex enough and the sharpness of the rolled edge will often break the thread if you try. Finish stitching through the four holes with about three stitches in each. Then knot off the thread and hide the knot under the snap. Mm -hmm. 
Before we attach the straps, we'll stitch the front and back together. Lay the front and back with wrong sides together. That means the nipple side of the snap is on the outside at this point, and the pocket and dimple sides are on the inside. Using a single strand of floss, whip stitch the first outer side together, down to where the cuff flares. Leaving the thread attached, open the two pieces, flipping the seam to the opposite side, and bring the floss through the split in the cuff. Now, stitch the remaining portion of the seam on the new side. By stitching the seam in this way, the resulting side seam will have all of its stitching inside, even on the turned up cuff. Now repeat on the opposite side. Now we can turn the pants right side out and pinch the side seams a bit to flatten them. Pants this scale are difficult to turn with the legs finished. So I like to stitch the seam on the outside of the leg on the wrong side of the fabric as we just did. Then the less visible seam between the legs called the inseam can be stitched on the outside. You can leave both your knots starting and ending on the stitching side when you stitch the inseam because we'll turn up the cuffs shortly and they'll both be hidden. Now use a pair of needle nose pliers or tweezers to help turn up the cuffs. You can probably manage it with your fingers, but having a tool like this is very handy. Before we add the straps, let's try it on to make sure we get the straps and the final snap side in the right places. Snap the straps to the front of the bib, then put the dungarees on, slipping Otter's tail through the split in the back. Press the snap side into the felt to make an indentation. Now you have the location for the remaining snap side. Remove the dungarees and mark its placement if you want to or just stitch the snap over the indentation in the same manner that we attach the bib snap sides. All that's left now is the final attachment of the straps on the back. Slip the dungarees onto Otter and snap the closure. Then bring the straps over his shoulders, crossing them in the back and tucking their angled ends under the edge. Pin them in place and remove them via the bib snaps. Now, use either a running stitch or an edge-to-surface whip stitch to attach them to the back edge of the dungarees. Now, Otter's ready for one final detail, marking in his paws. We don't have hairspray stiffening the fiber on the paws, so use a light touch with the Micron pen as not to snag the fibers. Move slowly and allow the ink to soak in as you make the markings. Add four oval pads at the paws edge and one central pad below them. You can do this on his feet as well if you like. So that is it for making Otter, my friends. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and thank you so much for joining me today. If you haven't downloaded Otter's chapter yet, you can do so on Bookmarked Hub. And for those of you who enjoy sharing pictures of what you've made, please send them to me on Instagram and Convo. I really enjoy seeing them and I, I just can't wait to see what you've made. Uh, and now if you'll give me a moment, we'll open things up to a Q&A.